For the ending of the A section, in the first repetition, there are two versions by Barrios, um, both of different rhythmical poles. The first one is more straight and it sounds like that. So we have one, two, one, two, one. Very straight. The second version contains an amiola and is maybe a little bit more interesting, therefore. So if we have one, two, one, two, three, one. It's worth mentioning that Bach himself used pretty frequently the amiola and it is known that Bach was a big influence on this piece and in general um, for Barrios. So I can show you a few examples of uh, Bach, Bach's and Miolas. Um, for example, in the first lute suite, the ending of the presto, prelude presto, it goes like that. <laughs> Another example is uh, the end of the fuga in the second lute suite, BWV 997. It goes like that. So if you count one, two, Moving on, in this part I think it's most important to show the cantabile in the bass or and at the same time uh, give attention to the, accent, to the syncopated note in the upper line. Because of its character, of the syncopated character, it has to be accented and connected. So the A has to be connected to the G. Okay? Uh, and that is exactly the reason why I don't like the usual fingerings for this passage, which goes like that. Okay, what happens here, you don't connect naturally the A and the G. And also, the last G is quite very often is not even heard because we are rushing to the next position. You see, so I suggest choosing a fingering that from the first place catches all the notes in the same position without the need to move too much. And for example, or if you play here. It looks like moving to the scale. If the slur on four and three is too difficult, you, you might want to consider playing with two and one, which is which are the stronger fingers and easier to slur with. So you play the slur then move back to the position or you just stay in this position okay most versions suggest a slayer on the second beat yeah um, ask yourself why because let's go back to the harmony what, what does the harmony tell us? It's just a B minor chord, which doesn't really change throughout the bar. So, um, there is no real reason to accent. I'm not saying that it is bad to do it, but ask yourself why you want to do it. So, um, if you want to uh, eliminate this layer will sound
sound like that or even better if you don't want any accents staying in one position you know changing positions always mean directly or indirectly mean an accent so here is an example of staying in the same position when playing the scale so if you come from here again you can use the campanella I like this uh, fingering very much, it has this kind of a baroque flavor to it. Okay, from this, if, you, if you're playing it in this position, it has this brightness. So you can combine it with scale and campanella, or you can just play a scale. Looks like that. After playing the last note, of course I played apoyando in order to create the direction to this note. Then I like to stop all other resonances and only let this D ring, maybe a nice vibrato. And then I catch the upper D with the lower D and continue the melody on the bass. So, what can I say about this B part? Some people like to play an echo effect on the repeating bar. It goes like that. Okay, some maybe like to create another color on the repeating part. so on. Um, some maybe like to create a long crescendo or maybe a long diminuendo throughout the phrase. All are fine versions as long as you play from the heart and with full conviction. A campanella effect can be very rewarding. It's easy to play, it's fluent. The danger of it is that too many notes sound simultaneously. You can compare it to a pianist playing while the pedal is uh, stressed or on the whole time. So too many notes together, especially in longer scales like this one. You see, it, it sounds already dirty, it sounds like a cluster. So you have to control it. By that I mean you have to stop every time the previous note. How can you stop? I stop every time either with the right hand or with the left hand but um, the most important thing is that your ears are alert and then you can use one of the hands to stop or even both hands together to stop the previous notes. Um, let me show you. Uh, let me show you in real time. You see this sounds more like a scale, more clean but if I don't, if I don't stop I get this cluster around it. Okay, so to summarize, Campanella, it's a very rewarding effect, it's easy, it's fluent, but it is also wild and needs to be tamed. I like to stress this beat with, a, with an apoyando. Now we come here to this chord this chord can play uh, in various ways. So we have these three options. The good, the bad and the ugly. No, maybe they're all good but having a different uh, character to them. So let's examine all of them. Uh, if I play this one, very bright and clear. Let's check the other one, the second one. Maybe a little bit more resonating. 
I like that too. The third one is also very expressive. You can really vibrate and hear this fourth string. So it's up to your uh, taste. Um, a trick some professionals do, but they will probably never tell you about it, is uh, using, a, instead of playing the last B in this figure, they play it one octave lower on an open string. And what that makes is it's allowing you much more time to slide and catch the next position. That makes things much smoother and easier and probably more fun, less stress. In passages like this, which uh, are a bit difficult and, we, and can create panic sometimes even, um, I think it's important to breathe, slow down a little bit in your mind, hold back. You know, see things a little bit like in slow motion, like the matrix. Um, we often rush in those kind of passages where we fear. And um, by doing that, we are turning it from a difficult passage into an impossible one. So, uh, why do we rush? Because of fear. Our instinct, instinct tells us to run for our lives. Um, we are in survival mode. This phenomenon is engraved strongly in our DNA from the old jungle days where you would encounter a predator and had to run for your life. So did it ever happen to you? You are sitting on stage, you are playing and suddenly you start thinking about this hazardous arpeggio that is coming in uh, in a few bars, in four bars, in three bars. Oh, it's there, it's there. Your fingers are getting cold, your heartbeat is, is getting faster, and by the time the, the passage is, is, by the time it's time to play, it's already 100 times more difficult to execute than how it was yesterday when you sat in your room practicing. Let me just emphasize that this process of slowing down or holding back is merely in your head. It's more mental than physical and it's meant to give you an edge. The listener probably won't even realize that you slow down. What they will realize is that you played with elegance and ease. So with that, all that said, I think we have covered as much as we could in this short time. I hope it inspired you to find your own thoughts and approach to the interpretation of this wonderful music. And now I'd like to finish the talk with another famous quote by the yoga master, Yogi Bayan. If you want to learn something, read about it. If you want to understand something, write about it. If you want to master something, teach it. By teaching it today, I feel a step closer in my relationship with the piece, and I hope that you do too. Thank you very much for watching all the way. I wish you success and happiness, and I'll see you the next time.
Thank you.